Good morning. Today's scripture reading will be from Ephesians chapter 1, from verse 15 to 23. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the, his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. God bless the reading of his word. Amen. Thank you, Yana, for reading our scripture today. I appreciate Dr. Steve Washburn, my friend, preaching while I was gone last week. Uh, Ken and Kathy Keller, who were uh, members of this church years ago, they're uh, back in their home in the Paris area and asked uh, Diane and me to come up and we got a chance with Herb and Sharon and Ken and Kathy to enjoy the eclipse on Monday and prior to that had several speaking opportunities at First Baptist Church Paris events that surrounded and celebrated the uh, eclipse. So that was fun. I'm glad to be back with the Hillcrest family today. And this morning we begin a series on how to pray for others. I sense a uh, desire in our congregation to do more and more of that, to pray for each other and pray for others. Our series is called Catalyst, and that's what you can be when you pray for others. You remember your high school chemistry class, you learned that a catalyst is a substance that creates a or causes a chemical reaction. And in the business world, the word catalyst is, is used to refer to a man or woman who, who uh, inspires change in the organization or in other people's lives. And that's what you can be. You can be somebody who inspires change in others in the way you pray for them. Uh, now, if that's true, then our spiritual enemy is going to do everything he can to keep you from being a catalyst. Uh, he is going to try to interfere with that process in every way. In a little book on prayer called The Still Hour, Austin Phelps wrote about Ethelfrith. He was the Saxon king of Northumbria. And uh, Phelps explained what happened when the pagan king prepared to attack Christian Wales. The pagan king, Ethelfrith, noticed that there were some people without armor, without weapons, and he asked who they were. And he was told that they were the monks of Bangor who were praying for their army's victory. And Ethelfrith said, attack them first. Though he was a pagan, he intuited that there was something powerful emanating from those men. We need to recognize then that our spiritual enemy sometimes believes in prayer more than we do because he's going to try to interfere with our desire for prayer. He's going to tell us that it's not practical. He's going to tell us that there are more practical things we can do. He's going to convince us that we are too busy for it. He's going to convince us that we are not qualified for it. How do we overcome that? How do we pray for others? When you were a child, you learned to write the letters of the alphabet by looking at models. Your parents or your teachers put up models on the overhead projector or on posters, and over and over again, you traced out the, those letters in such a way that you could, could learn to mimic it, learn to follow after it. In the same way, we have something like that in the New Testament. 13 of the 27 books that make up the New Testament are letters from Paul. And frequently in his letters, 
he tells the people how he is praying for them. And if we will hold those up as models and trace them, like learning the alphabet, if we will, through our prayers, trace out how to pray, we will learn from Paul how to pray for others. And so for the next couple of uh, months, uh, Lord willing, we are going to look at the, the prayers of Paul and the letters of Paul and trace those out like we're learning the alphabet all over again. Now we start today with a passage that Jana read to us, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. But now before we look at what Paul prayed, let's notice in these verses why Paul prayed. Look again at verses 15 and 16. Ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. So what was happening here? Paul was highlighting where he saw God already at work. And he prayed more God, do more of that in their lives. Now what typically prompts us to pray for others? If we pray for others at all, what typically prompts us to do so? Frustration, or maybe problems in their lives that we hope that God will overcome. God, fix my teenage daughter. God, turn around my stubborn husband. God, wake up my lethargic church group. And so we pray in this manner. Now, Paul could have prayed like that. I mean, we've read his letters in the New Testament. He had a lot of problems that he needed to address in his various churches. He had a number of frustrations that he wanted God to fix, no doubt. But in Ephesians chapter 1, he doesn't say, God, fix these people. God, straighten out these people. What did he do? He, he said, God, I recognize what you're already doing in their lives. Do more of it, God. Do more of it. So there's a difference between being a catalyst and just being a cynic. A, a, a cynic or a critic calls attention to frustrations with other people, but a catalyst is somebody who calls attention in his or her prayers to what is already praiseworthy in the situation that might cause them some frustration. So you need to look for how God is at work in the lives of those you are praying for. And that means the first work of a catalyst is to have clear eyes and a full heart. You probably know where that phrase comes from. You might remember watching that television series, Friday Night Lights, and as the boys got ready to leave the locker room and go out onto the field of battle, they had this chant, this mantra that they said uh, before they went out, clear eyes, full heart, can't lose. What we need to do is say, clear eyes, full hearts, let's pray. We need to have our eyes clearly open to what God is already doing in a situation we want to pray, uh, pray about. And we need to have hearts full of praise that God is already at work even before we thought to pray about it. And then we need to get to the business of prayer. Now the point of emphasizing this is, is not to say that we should never criticize or we should never express frustration or we should never express concern about what's going on in somebody else's life. Of course we ought to do that, but we ought to do it from a platform of confidence. And nothing will build greater confidence in God's ability to fix that problem or address that issue than seeing how God is already at work fixing that issue and addressing that problem. So Paul entered into prayer with his eyes open to the way that God was already at work. Like children learning to write the letters of the alphabet by looking at models, we can learn to pray for others by looking at this example of Paul and praying in this manner. Now, as we understand that then, as we're on this platform of confidence of what God is already doing in somebody else's life, now we can learn the requests that we need to lift up. And as he was inspired by seeing God already at work, what did he pray for? Well, we find this in verses 17 through 19. And basically, he prays for two things. He wants them to know God, and he wants them to know God's benefits. Did you see that when the scripture was being read to us? In verse 17, I want you to circle the words, so that. He says in Ephesians 1:17, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. And then I want you to circle the phrase, in order that, in verse 18. He says in verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that 
You may know, and then he lists off benefits. You may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance and his holy people, his incomparably uh, great power to those who believe. And so in some, what he's saying is, I pray so that you may know God and in order that you may know his benefits better. And we need, we need both. He, he wanted them to have God and to have God's benefits. And, and the way Paul prayed is very much in line with the way Jesus taught us to pray. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught us to lift up six prayer requests. Three pertain to knowing God. Three pertain to gaining God's benefits. And so we pray in the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. These are regarding God's glory. And then we pray about things we need in life. So we ask that he would give us our daily bread, that he would forgive our sins, that he would help us to overcome our temptations. That's the way Jesus taught us to pray. And so it's no surprise that this great disciple of Jesus, the Apostle Paul, wanted to pray in that same way. He prayed that, uh, that the Ephesians would know God and that the Ephesians would know God's benefits. And we need to pray in that way as well. If you're going to pray for your friend, what your friend really needs is a deeper experience with God and a deeper appreciation of God's benefits. If, they, uh, if you have some concern about your adult son or daughter who's so far from God, what they need is a deeper experience with God and a deeper appreciation of God's benefits. If you want to pray for your life group, your youth group, your men's group, or the wider church fellowship of this church, you need to pray that they would experience, that we would experience God, and that we would have a greater appreciation for God's benefits. So let's break this apart. First prayer is a deeper experience with God. Again, verse 17. Notice how Paul put it. Paul asked that God would grant them the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know Him better. Wisdom and revelation. Wisdom. What do you think of when you think of wisdom? You think of taking what you already know and applying it strategically to your situation in life. And when you hear revelation, what do you think? You're thinking a, a, an exposure to some knowledge that you don't already yet know. So we need both of those things, don't we? We need the Spirit to provide us wisdom. So, for example, you hear a lesson on sexual purity, sexual ethics. You have the knowledge about that now. Wisdom is applying it in settings in your own life. On the other hand, maybe you've never sat down to see what God has to say about managing your finances and how to give generously. And you open up the Word and you are given revelation, new knowledge for what you need to be doing with your finances. And so we need both of these things. We need God to help us apply what we've already learned, that's wisdom, and we need God to continue to grant us what we have not yet learned, that's revelation. And this is an ongoing process. We never get to a point, no matter how far we get in the Christian life, no matter how far we get in experiences with life, we never get to the point that we no longer need any more wisdom or that we no longer need any more revelation. So Paul says that I pray that you will be given wisdom and revelation to this end so that you can know God better. It's a matter of having greater and greater experiences with God. He's not just the man upstairs. He's not the keeper of the stars. He is one who wants to know you personally and be known by you personally. And as you gain greater wisdom and greater revelation, that takes place. And so if you want to be a catalyst, if you want to make a difference in your life group and in this larger church and our impact in this community or with an adult son or daughter or a troubled uh, teenage son or daughter, what you need to do is pray. That, that they would know that they would have an experience of God through wisdom and revelation. Now here's the second prayer, a deeper appreciation for God's benefits. Not just a greater experience of God, but a deeper appreciation of God's benefits. He uses a very colorful phrase here in verse 18. He says, the eyes of your heart, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Now that's uh, the Bible verse that is behind that Paul Beloche song that we sing from time to time. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. And that was founded upon this verse. But here's an interesting thing. This verse is talking not just about our need to have our eyes open so that we might see God. 
This verse is about praying that the eyes of others might be open so that they might see God. And so as we sing that song from time to time, maybe we need to add a, a variation of that verse. We need to sing, open the eyes of my heart. Lord, open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. And also saying, open the eyes of their heart. Open the eyes of their heart. They need to see you. Because that's what we're finding in Ephesians chapter 1 is Paul's plea that God would open the eyes of their heart. Why? So that they might see all the benefits he is bringing to their lives, all the benefits he can bring to their lives. And so he describes these benefits in three balanced phrases in verses 18 and 19. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, may be opened, in order that you may know what? Three things. The hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Three things then. Hope and riches or resources and power. So let's look at each one of these statements. First of all, hope. Do you know a believer who needs a greater appreciation of this resource that God is fond of them, that God loves them. That's what he's talking about, the hope of his calling, the hope that what he called you to is going to be completed, that he's never going to get tired, he's not going to give up on you, he's not going to abandon you as too difficult a project to be involved in. He, he, he loves you and that love remains around. And so we need people to know the hope of his calling. One evidence that people are growing in their understanding of the gospel, one evidence that they're growing in their understanding of the Bible, is that they are more and more founding their assurance uh, of eternity on God's fondness for them instead of their performance for God. You know, uh, there are just so many people who kind of assume that this is the way that I can get God to like me. This is the way I can get God to answer my prayers. This is the way I can feel sure that as I face death, I'll enter into the gates of heaven and be accepted there if I do good stuff for God. And we need to do good stuff for God. But that is not the foundation of all of that. It's not the foundation of, of, uh, uh, of our prayers. It's not the foundation of our assurance that we'll go to heaven when we die. What is the foundation? The foundation is God is fond of you. He loves you. And when he said he loves you, he's not going to quit loving you. You know, we were listening, we were singing that song a moment ago, you're a good, good father. That's who you are. But then we turned around and sang what? And I am loved by you. And that's who I am. There are too many people who say, this is who I am. I am widowed. I am a widow. This is who I am. I am struggling financially. I am poor. I am sick. And all of these things may be true, but if we really understood that this is our true identity, I am loved by God, everything else would line up after that. There are way too many people who, that's not their identity. That's not the foundation of their lives. And so what we need to do is we need to pray that they would experience the hope of his calling. And then he goes on to say, resources, riches. You know, a believer who could use a reminder that God will supply all our needs in Christ. In the words of verse 18, we have the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Now, strictly speaking, Paul is talking about this this inheritance that we're heading toward uh, into the next life. That people may not recognize this about us now. We may not always recognize this about us now, but we are sons and daughters of the King. And we have a rich inheritance waiting for us. But on the authority of every other scripture I could point to, uh, or, or I could point out to you, I can say this. We can pray on behalf of other people that maybe God sent a little advance from that inheritance to us at this time. Have you ever had that uh, situation happen in your life where you ask your boss for an advance on your upcoming paycheck because of the way that life is working out? You need it now. You can't wait for two weeks. You ask for an advance. I think that we can ask that of God for, on behalf of other people too. Lord, we know that this inheritance is coming from them. Would you give them an appetizer of that now? Would you give them an advance payment of that right now because they have that need in their lives? We leave that up to God as to how he's going to answer that. But on the authority of Scripture, I can say we can pray without hesitation for that. 
and we can pray that they would know this inheritance is coming, even if that advance doesn't come right now. So three things, hope and resources, and then power. We all need a power from beyond ourselves. Do you know somebody like that? Maybe a new Christian who's trying to establish holy habits. Maybe uh, a long-standing Christian who's still beset by certain habits that need to be broken. Maybe someone who is a church leader burdened with responsibilities or someone who is secretly fighting. Uh, not everybody knows, but you know that they're fighting uh, to overcome depression or anxiety or fear. We all need a power from beyond ourselves. And one of the reasons we must pray for fellow believers is that they may experience that power. Now, it's really interesting here that Paul can't just leave it alone and just say, I pray that you'll experience power. I mean, the second half of these verses are all about the power that God wants them to experience. He, he talks about it as the same power that it was at work to raise Jesus from the dead and exalt him above everything. We find that in verses 20 through 23. Have you ever realized that? That the very same power that was at work in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, reanimating cells, getting a heart beating again, getting uh, air flowing through the lungs again, and even more important than that, getting that body into a resurrection body, the eternal resurrection body, all the power that was involved in that. Do you know that that's coursing through you if you're a believer in Jesus? I mean, that's like the power of a hydroelectric, the water power of a hydroelectric dam flowing through to generate power in that dam, right? That's happening in your life. The power that raised Jesus from the dead is coursing through your life or can course through your life as a believer in Jesus Christ. Do you think that that's enough power to help you fix your marriage? Do you think that's enough power to help you overcome unforgiveness and bitterness? Do you think that's enough power to make you courageous enough to speak openly about Jesus to your lost friends? Of course it is. All the things that we know we need to get around to doing, we have the power already accessible to us. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead, according to the Apostle Paul, is available to us. And not just us, uh, to us, but also to those we love. And so if we're going to pray for them, let's pray that they experience that kind of power as well. So three things here, hope, resources, and power. Paul prays, I want you to know the hope of his calling, the riches of his inheritance, and his incomparably great power. Your friends, your loved ones, your church members, your ministry staff, we need those three things. It's your job to pray that we might experience those three things. You can be a catalyst as you ask God to help those you love gain a deeper uh, experience with God and a deeper appreciation for God's benefits. A pastor was used to extending his invitation at the end of every sermon in this way. It's time for us to get on our knees and give our hearts to the Lord. It's time to get on our knees and give our hearts to the Lord. The people heard it every single Sunday. It was just a routine that the pastor communicated. But as is the case with those of us who are public speakers and those of us who use similar phrases over and over again and what we have to say. One time, his brain must have just been in neutral. That happens to us who speak publicly from time to time. And he got his words crisscrossed and he got up there and with conviction in his heart, looking everybody in the eye, he said, it's time that we got on our hearts and gave our knees to the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> no, that wasn't what he intended to say, but maybe that's what some of us need to do today. We need to get on our hearts and we need to give our knees to the Lord. We need to commit ourselves to be intercessors on behalf of people we know and people we love. We need to pray that God would do great work in their lives. When God wants to take someone to the next step in spiritual growth, when God wants to prepare someone to tighten their hold on his hand before they come across some great challenge, when God wants to open up a new chapter in a church's life, often the first thing he does is he raises up an Apostle Paul. He raises up one or several someones who will pray 
that that will happen in the life of that individual or that life group or that church. And God may be stirring your heart to raise you up to that responsibility. Maybe God brought you in here today or had you log on online today so that you would hear his call to become an intercessor on behalf of other people. So how can we begin? Well, first of all, you'll notice in your sermon notes, I've given you a homework assignment. And for the next two months, Lord willing, as we go through the prayers of Paul, you're going to get this updated homework assignment every week. It's called Take Five. And what I want you to do is take five minutes, five days this upcoming week to pray for five people in the manner we've just learned how to pray. And so go over these uh, verses once again, every single day, Monday through Friday, and see how you can pray five minutes for five people in this manner that we've looked at today. And let's look for God to do something. But even before we get to that homework assignment starting Monday morning, we can begin praying for others now. And so I want you to bow your heads and your hearts and give your knees to the Lord. I'm going to ask John to play some music on the piano or Felicia. And what I want you to do is, uh, you can pray right there in, in your seat with your heads bowed in prayer. But these, these steps are open too. And we just wanna give some time for you to come and just put into practice what we've looked at today. Certainly you can come and pray for yourself. I hope there's some matters that you need to talk to the Lord about regarding you and your heart. But I know that there are people you care about and they're not exactly where they need to be with the Lord or they're trying to be so faithful to God, they love Him dearly, but they're going through challenges and problems in their lives. And you need to pray for them right now. You need to pray for what's going on physically or financially, but you also need to pray for their hearts, that they would experience God as well as appreciating God's benefits. Maybe you don't have any particular prayer requests. You just want to come up and, and in prayer, just thank God for all he's doing in your husband's life or your kids' lives or all he's already doing in the life of somebody, somebody else that you care about. So would you do that right now? Just come up. We'll just take the time we need to lift these matters up to God on our knees in prayer at this altar. Let's do that. Lord God, we're so grateful that you love us and we want to express our love to you. We thank you that that is who you are and who we are. And we want to more and more ourselves find our identity and worth and security in your settled opinion of us and your settled commitment to us. And we ask that that would not only be our experience, but the experience of those we love and care about, that they too would experience this um, 
abiding, relentless commitment that you have so perfectly demonstrated in Jesus, this commitment to love us. We ask for those we know about and care about, and we ask that you would work in their lives. We praise you for what you have already been doing in their lives. We ask that you would give us clear eyes to see how you're already working in some marvelous way in their lives, and let us have full hearts of gratitude for that. But on the platform of that praise, on the platform of that confidence, we come and say, more God, more in their lives, in the lives of the members of our common ground group, in the, or our life group, in the lives of those in our church, in the lives of those on our various ministry teams. We pray for them, and we ask, Lord, that that life would be different, life would be better because we've committed ourselves again to be a catalyst on their behalf, praying on their behalf. We lift these things up to you now in Jesus' name. Amen.